Welcome to our international panel with the international guests of uh, Stockholm Pride, who this year are Lili Dragojeva uh, from Sofia Pride in Bulgaria, uh, Akos Modolo uh, from uh, Symposium Association, I probably slaughtered the name, I'm so sorry about that, uh, from Bad Budapest, Hungary, uh, Kamil Maczuga from Atlas of Hate and Rzeszów Pride uh, in Poland, and Alex Kokot from Ljubljana Pride in Slovenia. First of all, welcome to Stockholm. Uh, and I would like to start off the discussion with asking you, in general, how is the legal situation of LGBTQ people in your countries? Hi. <laughs> thank you for having us and thank you for being interested in the situation in our countries. Um, uh, well, the answer for Bulgaria is quite easy. We don't have any legal rights for LGBTI people. We have only one uh, act that talks about LGBTI rights, and this is the Anti-Discrimination Act that says that no one should be discriminated against for their sexual orientation. It does not include gender identity. It does not include sex characteristics. And it was only uh, enacted as a condition to Bulgaria entering into the European Union. So that's it. Could we move to Akash? Okay, so yeah. first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and for having me. Uh, well, right now, I would say that the, the legal situation for LGBT people in Hungary has um, become worse and worse, in the, especially in the last uh, two years, because before that, I would say that to Eastern European standards, it was quite uh, good or it was quite okay because uh, since 2009 we have uh, um, the civil partnership for same-sex couples, we had uh, anti-discrimination laws based on sexual orientation and gender identity, um, but uh, since 2012 we have a, a constitutional ban on same-sex marriage and uh, the definition of family um, is restricted so they say that family is a man a woman and a child so um, we have a new government since 2010 uh, which is a, a very right-leaning government and they introduced a new constitution and they introduced this new constitutional ban on uh, equal marriage then uh, uh, last year uh, they introduced a law which basically bans legal recognition of gender, which basically makes the existence of transgender people. Um, so basically they don't exist legally in Hungary. Uh, and then last year they made it impossible for, um, for single individuals to adopt, which basically makes it impossible for um, same-sex couples um, to adopt and um, this year they introduced a new anti-LGBT law in June which got a huge international and national response in Hungary which basically bans um, homosexual and, um, and transgender propaganda to minors and in the schools and um, this is a very vague law, so we we don't really know um, what is forbidden, we don't really know what will be the consequences or the punishments if somebody breaks this law, because legally speaking it's very hard to define what promotion means, because promotion is forbidden, but, but if we are just talking about being LGBT, if we are just talking about um, LGBT or transgender topics, then somebody might say that okay this is promotion and should we be afraid of getting criminal charges because of that or should be uh, teachers be afraid of talking about that at school so um, we are still in a process that we are still figuring it out what this will mean in a practical sense In Poland, actually, nothing has changed since ages, so we do not have any progress on LGBTI rights. Um, so we do not have the equal marriage or even the law that protects us. The, we don't have the anti-discriminatory education. Um, it was like 
going quite positively until 2019 when um, our ruling party decided to use us as a public enemy and um, there are hundreds of local governments on a different level, so municipalities, counties or voivodeships that declare themselves that they are free from LGBT. And there was an attempt and there still will be an uh, attempt to ban um, its so-called homo propaganda like in Hungary, uh, in Poland. Alex? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the uh, invitation. And uh, I'm excited to see you all here and online. So um, uh, what I would like to, to mention is uh, uh, the results uh, from ILGA, Europe, the human rights uh, situation of LGBT uh, people uh, in 2021, that Slovenia, which was the first independent country after Yugoslavia, uh, has now, uh, I will just <laughs> put the numbers out, uh, it has now 42% of LGBT IQ plus human rights. Uh, like if I mention, can mention uh, Croatia, they're our neighbors, they have 46% of human rights LGBT. And Montenegro, 63%, what is really nice. And uh, But if I can say Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, have 40%, so we are really similar to, to, to this percent, what I was saying. And uh, what I still want to say is that like hist uh, historically and uh, systematically what oppressed uh, by not having equal rights uh, when it comes in Slovenia, it comes to adoption and by medical uh, insemination and donating blood as a, as a gay man. So this is like so that's what I want to say. Uh. This year's Sofia Pride uh, actually caught, uh, re gathered a record-breaking crowd, and it is one of uh, rather few festivals, uh, Pride festivals that happened physically this year. Uh, despite it being in a rather tumultuous period when it comes to politics, it happened between a scheduled election in uh, April and a snap election in July. Uh, so, politically speaking, it was a, a very busy period. And it also happened at the end of a string of, a violent, of violent incidents uh, ahead of, of the festival uh, in the whole, all of com uh, whole country. Uh, can you tell us how this political cl climate affected Sofia Pride? Yeah. yeah, you're right. It was a very interesting and different year in so many ways. So I think that the game changer this year was really having Sofia Pride and all the supporting events taking place before an election. We in Bulgaria, we have elections either in the spring or in the fall, but because the spring elections couldn't form a government, we had to go into intermittent uh, elections in July. And in the April elections, the so-called patriots, the far right, the nationalistic parties didn't make it to the parliament. So they were desperate to gain votes and to activate their people. So they decided, and it was great for them that we had Sofia Pride and all the events taking place because they could use them to create hysteria in the society that LGBTI people are making propaganda, that we're going to ruin the traditional family and all of that. So they had organized attacks on almost every event that we had from our supporting program. We had book readings, we had movie screenings, we had sports events, community events, everything. And so people like men 20 to 25 in number in black hoodies would come would throw objects eggs would slur would try to provoke incidents uh, so this was something that is a new phenomenon we didn't have that in bulgaria over the last years the first sofia pride in 2008 was pretty violent uh, cocktails molotov and stones were thrown at the participants but this was not the, the situation in recent years. So actually having this increase in violence was a new thing for us that really scared the community, but also was, was a thing that we mobilized. We were just talking now before the panel how in Hungary the same thing happened. The act of the government against the community actually made the community come up and be more united. So this is also what happened in Bulgaria and we had really 
this uh, turnout of 10,000 people, which for COVID situation is a miracle in itself, but also for Sofia Pride, it's the biggest ever. Uh, so this was amazing. And um, another thing that's really important is that the Green Party, the Greens, they have historically been supportive of uh, Pride in Bulgaria, but they were never in government. So their voice was not really that much hurt while well, this year they are part of the government in uh, the april elections and in july as well so in may when they came up with a statement of support and condemning the attacks they were parliamentary represented which is a historic act for the first time a parliamentary represented party in bulgaria supported the lgbti community which i think is really really important and the biggest and greatest news is that the patriot patriots didn't make it into the parliament so regardless of their efforts we counter mobilized we had a voting campaign that we called vote with love and we tried to mobilize our community and our allies to just go out and vote so that we could prevent them from entering and i hope we made it Uh, Camille, you mentioned that the community was attacked in Poland in connection to, to the elections as well. So I, I imagine you recognize the situation that uh, Lily is uh, describing from your own experiences as well. Yes. Could you tell us about more how um, the, the, the attacks uh, were conducted in Poland? Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, uh, on 2019, um, ruling party decided to use us as a public enemy and they actually started a massive campaign against the LGBT people in the public television. Um, they were, um, of course, comparing us to um, pedophiles or, um, um, or there was even a production, film production um, called Invasion about us. And um, it was always connected with the election. Um, in 2019, before the European Parliament election, um, some of the local governments um, created the document that is saying that this area is free from LGBT ideology. And to understand why they are calling it LGBT ideology, we need to go back few months as um, the newspaper uh, sponsored by the government um, announced that they are going to add the stickers to the newspaper that says um, area free from LGBT. And as they um, were then more af afraid that because they are, they were being sued so they, in the last minute, changed the stickers to uh, area free from LGBT ideology. So first of all, there were this, just the stickers added to them. But then, um, yeah, the, um, the city, one of the, on the uh, east side, declared themselves on a on actually my birthday, 27th of, of March, uh, that they are free from LGBT. And then it just was copy pasted to other governments. And um, I'm, I'm the member of Atlas of K team, which our pro project is about to collect in the information and we picture everything on the map. So we can go to the Atlas of Hate website and see that one third of Poland is covered with such areas. And um, they were doing it, so the number of such declaration was always increasing during the elections. So firstly, European Parliament and Parliament election, and then uh, even the presidential election. Um, so uh, they are using us as a... Um, and why they are using us as a public enemy? Because last um, voting, presidential voting, showed that their uh, majority is not such big. Because there was like one or two percent difference between the candidate of opposition and the ruling party. 
So they are using this narrative to obtain the votes from the far right. From the what? A far right. right. The conservatives, yeah. We also seen an upswing in solidarity within the community and from your allies. Yes, uh, the thing is that the more they are trying to intimidate us and um, to compare us to the worst things, we actually gained more and more supporters in, in Poland because there was a lot of people who are not interested in this topic and do not have stand on it. And right now when they seen the pr uh, for example, the pride in Białystok, which was very tragic and dramatic because the hundreds of people were attacked by the uh, nationalists and because they um, invited the nationalists from whole Poland in one place to defend the Białystok. And this was the pride that was described the, um, abroad. Even the US was writing about it. And um, the acts of solidarity uh, each time, because um, yeah, there was a lot of bad things um, happened recently. Um, we are always supporting each other as a community from different cities in Poland. Very hard, heartwarming to know that there is such a solidarity, but of course chilling to, to see that it comes at the Thailand of, of violent incidents. Uh, Akos, uh, as you mentioned, the, the situation in Hungary has been quite good in a few years back uh, compared to the rest of the region. Uh, as far as I know, Budapest Pride was the first event of this kind in the region. And uh, even now, uh, Pride events gather quite large crowds, uh, including some important political figures like the mayor of, of Budapest. Uh, and yet, uh, we have seen the, the anti-transgender law uh, last year. We have seen uh, the, the ban of, of what they call homosexual propaganda, uh, which was uh, approved with an overwhelming majority of 157 to just one. How could it change so dramatically in, in such a short, of ti a short time? Um, I think that uh, um, it, uh, it has more uh, reasons. Um, there, is f uh, there is one which is a political reason. Uh, so we had from 2002 till 2010, uh, we had um, left government, but uh, this government had um, a couple of scandals. They have lost the referendum to the right opposition. And then we had the financial crisis in 2007 and eight. So this left government um, was very unpopular at the end. So when um, we had the elections in, uh, in 2010, um, the Fidesz party, which is the right-wing nationalistic party, they gained a super majority in the Hungarian parliament uh, because the previous left government was very unpopular at the end. And um, as, I, as I mentioned before, they, they wrote a new constitution without the opposition parties. And um, they also uh, made a new um, uh, election system. So they have redrawn the, um, the election district. So basically what we have now is that with 1.5 million or with 2 million votes, they can have a super majority. So this means that, for example, we had the last general elections in, in 2018. Most of Hungarians did not vote for the government, but the government still um, gained a super majority in the parliament because with this political or election system, it's enough to have 2 million votes. So for this reason, uh, when it comes to social issues, they are um, appealing only to their voter base. So they are not trying to appeal to, uh, to the broader Hungarian society uh, when it comes to social issues, but um, a little similar, like you said, in Poland, they are trying to appeal um, to the, to the right-wing side to uh, of the of society and in the last years Fidesz has uh, has uh, uh, has gone more to the right 
and um, it has become in 2015 with the refugee crisis when the i think that it's it's very important to have a uh, discussion about immigration about refugees but what they did was not a discussion but it they did basically a hate campaign against refugees they had huge billboards on the streets and and uh, on tv and on social media all the time that refugees are terrorists they are going to take your job they are going to go after women and after kids and so they did a hate campaigns against refugees uh, and um, they are doing the same now with the LGBT community and this is a strategy of the Hungarian government that they are always trying to distract Hungarian society from uh, from other topics so uh, they are always trying to um, to find an enemy to blame for for the prob problems in Hungary I and mean, it was the refugees then they blamed homeless people, then they blamed Roma people, then they blamed uh, Brussels or the European Union, that the European Union wants to attack us that, and they want to erase the Hungarian national identity. And, um, and now they have found a new enemy, which is the LGBTQ community. And I think that they are doing this because now that we don't have a refugee crisis, but next year we are going to have a general election and the opposition now is doing very good in the polls and even in, in some polls they are even ahead of the government and this has not happened in the last 15 years that the opposition had a chance of winning so i think that the government um, wanted to uh, retake the lead from the opposition and uh, they wanted to make this uh, a main point of the public discussion uh, Alex, uh, this year's Ljubljana Pride has been held under the theme uh, Resist the Oppression. And uh, I've noted down a quote from one of the activists, uh, Katja Stefanets, uh, who said, just like yeah. every year, we're fighting for our rights. But since we're witnessing a rise in hate and regression in what we've already achieved, it's now even more important to preserve what we have achieved. So do you also see this trend of... Uh, reversing the progress and losing the ground in in, in making uh, LGBT rights more prevalent? Yes, uh, in uh, Slovenia, uh, LGBTIQ plus community in the past year or year and a half is attacked by the uh, right wing uh, government we have now. Um, and from the May 2020, when the um, the first lockdown happened uh, because of uh, COVID, um, we we started with uh, protest, anti-government protest uh, every Friday, and these protests are still still going on. Um, and uh, the point is that yes, we feel uh, this oppression uh from the government cu cu current government we have because what is happening now is that we have uh, politicians uh, they are openly speaking about uh against the lgbt community we have openly um a political party they are talking about uh and focusing to uh, anti lgbt work we are doing and and then we have the prime minister uh, that who, who is uh, tweet, uh, uh, retweeting these things all the time, um, and it's really alarming for 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 us. And um, the prime minister, what he's doing ideologically, on the same page as Orban, if I can mention, and uh, and is trying to follow the Hungary, what he can see. And uh, now he. We know that he is against LGBTIQ plus rights, um, and it's a matter of time when this uh, be more, will be more serious, like now. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge for the community in your countries? You know, we can start with Lily. Um, well, 
obviously the lack of any legal protection is a great challenge because this also leads to people not feeling welcomed enough in their home country. Many LGBTIQ plus people leave the country and come to live in Sweden or other countries where they can be granted proper treatment and respect and where their life and families will be valued and, and respected. So having the legal situation changed to cover at least uh, like basic minimum is really important um, and I think that the other thing we are very hard working on is really create better acceptance in society because legal change if even if legal change happens tomorrow not all LGBTI plus people will be open and will make use of the rights because simply their families, their neighbors, their co-workers, uh, the society in general will, will not be open and happy about it. So this goes hand in hand with actually changing hearts and minds. So really increasing the levels of understanding what LGBTI people are, that we're not aliens, what our struggles are. When we talk about equality, what do we mean? That we don't want special rights, we just want to have the same level of rights that other people have, that this is not the case. There is this big misconception and misunderstanding that we have all the other rights. Why are we so loud all the time? What do we want? Now, people don't understand that. So I need to go in and explain, well, if you and your partner have an apartment, you can inherit it and if me and my partner we don't and they're like but how come and I'm like well that's the law and they're like but that's not okay and I'm like yep right that's what I work that's what we're trying to change so I think that legal change and understanding and increasing the levels of acceptance are really really important Akos yeah I think one of the biggest challenges is that um I think the hardest is um, for transgender people because the legal recognition of gender was banned last year and for this reason a lot of transgender people, a lot of friends of mine, a lot of activists uh, have uh, left Hungary since last year because of course as a gay man if I want I come out, if I want I can hide so uh, I can still live like a, um, like um, an ordinary life but as a transgender person if somebody asks for your ID uh, at the post office, at the bank, or anywhere. So it's basically an everyday struggle. So um, so I think that um, it was very devastating for the Hungarian transgender community. So that is one of the biggest challenges, I think. And I think one of the other big challenges is, is that, um, so because of this new anti-LGBT law, um, it will be very hard for us to go to schools and talk with students about LGBT topics because so we have a school project which is called um, Getting to Know LGBTQ People and I am also a facilitator going to schools and this is a 21 years old project so we have a very long and um, significant professional background but after this new law it will be, I think, very, very hard to go to schools. And uh, I think this this would be very crucial because the government is spreading misinformation about LGBTQ topics. So, for example, the Hungarian state media is basically government propaganda. And, for example, they are promoting conversion therapies in Hungarian state media that if you are gay you can change and you can heal and if you believe God and if you are strong enough you and uh, this is funded by Hungarian taxpayers so so they are spreading uh, for example the um, Prime Minister Viktor Orban said that if you are a teenager and if, in the end if you are going through heartbreak gender change is not the good solution for that so he basically said so, and they are spreading these kind of crazy things and we and we hear when we hear these things in the media and we have to react them as LGBT associations we have a very hard time because we don't want to repeat all of this madness but we have to react that in some way so I think that a challenge is to to combat this misinformation in uh, in social media in the media but also uh, via, with our events and um, and the challenge is also that we want to reach out to young people 
and I if we cannot go to schools we have for example we have started to have um, to hold uh, to hold trainings for teachers for s social workers to psychologists so if we cannot reach the students directly then we can reach them indirectly or, or, or online through social media or we can go to universities so our, I think that our we are trying to look for solutions how we can uh, how we can uh, uh, continue our work uh, even though despite of this hostile legal and political environment. Kamil? Um, it might sound dramatic, but I think that the most challenging for LGBT community in Poland will be to survive the next years um, in a good condition, the health condition. Um, as um, our government will not change in at least two years and um, the campaign against us is still on and uh, our fight f well our fight is not fair so our enemies have for example they are using the trucks with uh, the that saying that LGBT people deprives children and they are pedophiles and so on and those buses you cannot even stop them because they are often protected by the police and um, yeah so um, yeah so sometimes it uh, um, LGBT activists because there was a situation when this um, truck was like whole day like saying this this those things near the uh, anarchist squad where the lgbt teenagers are living and um some someone decided to destroy it because like whole day you are hearing that you are a pedophile and the police did nothing about it so then it was uh, another reason to hate uh, LGBT people because the organization that is um, paying for this is called pro-life and how can you be um, not pro-life? And, um, and yes, the statistics before this campaign for LG LGBT people was already bad. So. Um, for example, just 65% of LGBT teenagers have suicidal thoughts and only like 12% of uh, parents will accept their homosexual children. And uh, usually um, coming out means losing someone from your family. And um, right now they're doing everything to even stop the activists. I can see that we are all extremely tired of protesting again uh, against something that has happened even uh, twice a week, but um, it's not the end. Uh, we are also being sued for our activism. So, for example, uh, participants of my project, which just shows the declaration that uh, local governments passed, um, they sued us, so the seven local governments decided to go to the court with us and they are demanding 20,000 slots per each government um, for defamation. So the problem is not that they made such a de decision, such statement, but that we talked about it and the world now know about it. And uh, of course, if we will not have the legal support from uh, campaigns against homophobia, um, we, we will probably might stop our work because imagine that uh, someone is saying if you are continue if you are going to continue your activism you're going pay pay us hundred thousand lot yeah <laughs> or even more um twenty thousand slot so per each case it's about five thousand euro Alex yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm shocked now. <laughs> uh, so uh, if I, if you said 5,000 5, euros. Yes. Uh, wow. That's great. That's, wow. Yeah, we have the with the protest 400 if you join the protest. The police are doing that. But 400, uh, but still it's a, a lot. So f no, crazy, crazy. Yeah. But the current uh, challenge, we have the same. Uh, maybe I can connect with... Uh, with you with Hungary, yeah, we had with the schools, uh, but uh, um, what I want to say is that uh, this year uh, the youth uh, 2020 survey uh, came out um, in Slovenia, it was published, and the survey was published uh, uh, every 10 years and uh, d d uh, by the government, they're doing that. So um, what is showing this survey is something is important I want to, uh, to, to, to say. So um, when the young people uh, were um, making the survey were, and they were asked about their gender identity and uh, sexual orientations, and uh, about 60% identified themselves like Hetero, extremely heterosexual. So what c we can see is that uh, around 40% of uh, young people uh, they uh, they don't recognize they're extremely um, heterosexual. No. Um, so th to us that means that we have LGBTIQ plus uh, young people in schools. No. So an another reality in Slovenia in extreme right social sphere and their intimidation and lies what they're uh, spreading them um, about that we are trying to uh, force and ideologize uh, to our schools uh, by talking about LGBT um, topics uh, and how t it's harmful for uh, children and youth. Um, it sounds sim similar what is uh, recently happening in Hungary, right? So yeah, and what is consequences of this is that young people are losing uh, safe space at schools and they don't have a, a, um, a support um, um, and freedom to talk about these topics. So yeah, this. Common theme that I am picking up is that of uh, an external enemy, so to speak. Uh, you, Camille, have mentioned the movie called Invasion. Uh, the, you also mentioned the, the LGBT-free zones uh, in Poland, as if there were no LGBTQ people in, in those areas. Uh, this is also the theme that uh, you, Akos, mentioned in the political campaigns in Hungary. Uh, and there has been signs of solidarity uh, abroad with communities in, in your countries. Uh, I could men uh, mention uh, the, the demonstrations in Munich uh, uh, around the, the football game between Germany and Hungary during the, the last championship. Uh, also, the EU has now launched legal actions between both Polish and Hungarian governments. Uh, I'm wondering how is this external pressure perceived uh, both within the community and in wider society? Could you start? Yes, of course. Um the actions that the European Union takes are extremely important, not only for me, I'm, I'm not living in Poland and Hungary, my colleagues will share how they feel about it, but me as an outsider uh, from those two countries that obviously we can see have the biggest challenges in terms of how aggressive the governments can be and coming from a place where this could be our future if things go the, the wrong way, um, I think that this pressure from the outside is really important. First, from the European Union, because this is where we belong and where we have chosen to be part of this bigger family. And so we need to stick to the values and principles and morale of the society. So for me, as a Bulgarian citizen, that I cannot influence on my own government because they pretend that LGBTI people don't exist, uh, then it is important to have the pressure from the outside and the solidarity that is built is really important. The fact that Stockholm Pride supported Sofia Pride this year, for example, the fact that we have embassies and people from outside 
who are coming, attending, joining. This is extremely important and it brings a sense of belonging for the community within Bulgaria. In the total absence of support from your own politicians and the people you pay your taxes to, to see that other politicians, other societies and other people from abroad care about you and want you to live better, this really creates an important message and people feel that support and love that's coming from the outside. Thank you. Akos? Um, I think that there is a negative and a positive side to that. So the negative part of it is, so as I, as I already mentioned, the Hungarian government has a rhetoric that we are always attacked from somebody, like for example from the European Union and from Brussels, and um, if, for example, if the European Union decides to cut funds um, to Hungary because of the anti-LGBT law, then um, this will maybe, so this pressure will maybe um, cause some kind of um, step back, but at the same time it will also enforce the rhetoric of the Hungarian government that, oh, they are continuing to attacking us and we are losing European money because of the crazy homosexual so they could use this kind of um, this uh, as a rhetoric or as a political tool but I think that the positive side to it is that when they introduced this new anti-LGBT law in June um, I was not expecting and I think that nobody in Hungary like the LGBT association but either the government was accepting such a big um, international response because it was really hu a huge, inter not, it was also in Hungary, but internationally it was such a huge response. Um, a lot of international politicians, celebrities, um, influencers uh, have spoken up and uh, so when the, the law got introduced, a lot of Hungarian activists were were very disappointed, were very depressed, very frustrated and as you mentioned, we have been fighting for years now and a lot of uh, most of the activists are volunteers and they have a full job uh, so we have uh, we have uh, limited capacities limited financial resources and now we have this new law but uh, he all this um, support from abroad from international sources it was uh, absolutely heartwarming we have also uh, received a lot of support from Sweden, so I want to um, thank you all for that. And we have also a very good relationship with the Embassy of Sweden in Budapest. I also know the um, uh, the previous Swedish ambassador. Uh, he he was also very supportive. He visited our association. Uh, so I think that it was heartwarming, and it gave us the strength. Um, to to continue our work and to to realize that uh, that it's absolutely worth it and maybe we have lost this this battle um, on the short term but on the long term I think that um, we can take this as an advantage because because of this new law a lot of people have spoken up who didn't before and I, I would say that the Hungarian LGBT community has never had such a big visibility and has never received such a big media attention and I think that on a long term we have to focus on this so I don't want to talk to the people who are very radical who are supporting the government I want to talk to the people uh, who want to have a conversation who want to have a dialogue and on a long term I think that this is what we have to focus on so on a long term I, I want to be opt optimistic because uh, because I can't wake up every day and be depressed all the time because we have to have hope and thank you Camille? Um, I think it's um, sorry can you repeat the question <laughs> external yeah external pressure okay um, yeah it's it's very important and you can see on um, uh, an example of Poland that First of all, when the um, first resolution of European Union came in condemning the LGBT free zones, which is actually um, a great job from uh, Swedish MEP Malin Björk. 
And um, when this came out, actually those declarations stopped. So there was no new declaration because they were starting to be afraid of losing the money. But right now there are serious uh, conversation between the European Commission and the areas that are um, LGBT free. And um, one, one of them is my voivodeship. It's like the biggest area uh, that can be. Uh, so there are 16 voivodeships in Poland. And um, so they received the information from the European C Commission that as they are declaring themselves as free from LGBT, they are not the right person to um, have the European funds uh, and that they will dis they are not right per person or body to distribute the, the money. And so they, mi they might lose 2.5 billion euros just for these declarations. And um, uh, we can see how the, our government reacted, because even the uh, prime minister take a stand on it, and he told that um, that there will be yeah there will be um, no disagreement with EU, and we and other politicians are saying that EU is trying to force ideology on Poland and attacks our independency. Alex? Yeah, I would like to add, yeah, we, like uh, as mentioned before too, that uh, the main issue what we have in the moment is the problem that, um, that the, our current government attacking uh, anyone who is against them um, or is to alternative and untraditional, and they are attacking independent media all the time, uh, uh, culture workers, um, NGOs, and democratic expression through the uh, protest I was just mentioning before. And LGBTIQ plus community is by default alternative uh, in, in uh, and under tra untraditional, uh, independent and critical to the government, the current government. And uh, so it's a clear thing that we are the enemy to them. So it's uh, have begun to some, we had some progress um, in our society and in the uh, exceptions among the young people, but between that uh, and the other hand, uh, we can see uh, how fast and strong systematic oppression um, can impact uh, every everyone uh, and uh, in the opposite way. Um, so Sometimes there is this notion that uh, in the public discourse that given time things will gradually improve uh, but uh, we have now seen uh, quite a lot of examples of that this is not always the case that progress can go the other way sometimes as well if uh, if not sustained uh, so uh, on that notion and on on the note of uh, external forces intervening in the, uh, the local affairs. Uh, our association has decided to support two organizations from each of your countries uh, with a donation. So I will ver now very briefly in my last question ask you to name those organizations. <laughs> Can we first thank you for this? <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much for this, uh, and I think that it's really important and on the note of solidarity, really understanding how we struggle and what our struggles are, and not only providing us with financial support, but actually giving us this floor. I think that raising awareness, it's important, and bringing more understanding of what's happening in other sides of Europe. Um, I would like to name two organizations that are at the core of Sofia Pride and also at the core of the first community center, the Rainbow Hub, so the Glass Foundation and the Bilitis Foundation. <laughs> uh, yes, I will be on the website. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I would like to name um, Labris Lesbian Association, which is the only lesbian association in Hungary. 
and we are working with them um, in the Getting to Know School sensitization project. So, and they were the ones who founded it. We joined them, and I, this is the program which is attacked by the government now with these new laws and I think that this is very important and the other organization is the Symposium Association. We are also working in a school program but we also have a, a video blog which is called Through Gay Eyes and we have also some English speaking um, videos um, and this is one of the most popular LGBT video blogs in Hungary and I think that com by combating misinformation um, it, it's really important. Thank you. Camille? Um, yeah, so the two organizations will be, the first one will be the, it's called Federation Equal Science. They, they are facing the uh, financial problem, but, uh, and they are actually uh, the LGBT center in Krakow, the mm -hmm. second biggest city, and we don't want to mm -hmm. like lose this. And the second will be the Pride uh, in Białystok, which is just working in a most challenging area in Poland. Thank you. Alex? Uh, yeah, um, thank you <laughs> for that. But yeah, um, I would say I was talking with my colleagues, so for sure we, we decided to to Koroszka Pride. Uh, they had the first uh, Pride Parade uh, last year in this uh, COVID situation, so it was really challenging for them, and there were like only six or seven people there doing that, so they really need support. Uh, and then uh, we have an organization called Kvartir. Uh, this year they will co collaborate with us with the uh, um, uh, Trans uh, Intersex March Balkan uh, trans intersex march we we had collaborated together uh, this year so these two thank you very much and thank you for this talk